Regrets I have a few. I did it my <laughs> Welcome again to Grace Believers Bible Study. And welcome to any and everybody that's no, here that on. wasn't here last week. week. Yeah. So what today is, oh, we have a couple in here that weren't here last week. But today, Brother Dave Barnes is going to con uh, continue. I don't know if he's going to finish, but he's going to continue in what he started last give week. give it a try. So without further ado, Brother Dave Barnes. All right. <laughs> Good morning. If you, um, if you need a paper, they're right there. There's some, Jim, right there, some papers. So you can pass them back to him. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to continue to study. You know, we were talking on the way over uh, in the car. Irma drives. I get to talk. It's great. I don't have to worry about driving. And um, there's a reason why young people are turning away from the church. They're turning away from the church because there's, to them, they look at the situation and there's no logic to it. Modern religion is all confusing. They're all hocus pocus. There's nothing to back what they talk about or say. And so the young people are saying, I don't want any of this. And they're walking away. You know, we talked about Irma's daughter, my kids. They know salvation. They know enough spirituality to be dangerous. We hope they're saved. But they're pretty much done with the church as a whole because the church is all this hocus pocus. And I can understand where they're coming from. I can see that. And that's why the congregation of the world, especially those, um, it's just getting older. You know, it's just the reality of it. And it's unfortunate. Because what we've been studying the last week and we're going to continue to study is information that really is radical compared to what other people understand and know. It is the difference between your salvation in some cases but it is the difference between having knowledge and being at peace with God or still being confused by the Bible. If you do not rightly divide your Bible, there is no way in the world you can read it and make any sense out of it. You're going to have to have conflicts. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Why do these two fit together? You can't put it together. You can mix it up and try to turn it into a stew, but it's still individual elements. And unless you understand how they fit together, you're never going to be at peace. And that's what this study is. We call it understanding the dispensation of grace. It is the most important thing you need to know so you can share it with others. That's why I printed all the verses on this. So you don't have to get your Bible out even. You can sit down with your cousin, your relative, your neighbor, and say, you want to talk about this? I'll share what I know here. I think it could change your life. And, and you're going to share things with them, and they're going to go, I never saw that before. I never saw that before. Because unfortunately, in modern religion, they get up and they preach for 20 minutes, they give you three verses, and they tell you their philosophy and how you're supposed to live. They do not teach you how to study. And you know, if you don't have somebody to show you some of this, even studying on your own would be difficult. But that's why there's preachers. To teach, to help people understand, and then you take it and you run with it, and then you can grow. And that's kind of what it's all about. Now, we're on the third page, but let's just do a quick review of what we talked about. In the beginning... Jesus did not come for us. He came for Israel. He came to set up a kingdom. And we learned about that. And we learned about the verses where, you know, the salvation was to the Jews. They were the ones who were going to be saved, not us. We were inconsequential. God had promised the Jews a kingdom. God had promised the Jews to rule over the world. And that was set up many, many years before. So the offer had to be made. The offer had to go out to this king, to this kingdom, these people, these Jewish folks. And that offer was done, okay? The kingdom, if you go to page, let's see, if you want to, page three, um, in your, in your, the kingdom is at hand. hand. In Matthew chapter three, verses one and two. In those days came John the Baptist preaching the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what was going to go down. That's what was being, it's so simple, it's so laid out, that if you don't see how it all fits together, and that's what the study's all about, you're not going to understand it all, okay? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did he say, believe on me on the cross in my death? No, because it hadn't happened. Because if the Jews had accepted Jesus as their kingdom, king and their Messiah, it would have set up a kingdom. That would have never gone off, folks. And we'd be in the kingdom age today. But you know what? God in his wisdom knew better, but he had to make the offer because he promised it. Okay? And that offer went out. 
Um, salvation under the kingdom, Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Mark 1, 4. But John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. That's how it went down. That's why they were at the, at the side of the river when they fed the 5,000. I believe all that baptism activity was going on, and that's how you got into the kingdom. You repented, you changed your ways, you were baptized, you were put into the kingdom. You were now part of this kingdom that was being set up. But unfortunately, the Jews rejected it. But the opportunity was there, and the offer was there. And that's where we're going to continue now. If you flip over to page number one, two, three, four. Page number four at the top is where we left off at. Okay? And even after they killed Jesus, which we're going to get to in a little bit here, the offer was still being made. Look at Acts chapter 238. This is a big problem and where a lot of modern religion gets totally confused and they are totally lost. They read this verse and go, that's what we need to do. And the verse says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many people have heard that in their church services? Over and over and over? How many people have read that on the marquee out in front of the church? Millions and millions and billions of people do not understand where salvation lies today. And unfortunately, they are lost. Salvation is so simple, okay? It is so straightforward, yet the people want to make it complex, okay? I'm going to talk about this a number of times, but let's go there first of all. What is salvation today? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. We read these all the time. But this is it, folks, and if you're out there watching this out there in television land or whatever it might be on the Internet, understand this is where salvation lies, not in all those activities being set up for the kingdom. And we'll see that. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have also received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have been believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, and here it is, first all that, excuse me, first of all, that which also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. Our acceptance of that is our salvation. And that puts all of the effort and the success of salvation where? On Christ, not on me. It isn't about me performing, being baptized, dancing through the hoops, doing good things, making people happy, impressing my neighbors. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do whether or not I accept what Christ did. Romans chapter 4.25 who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Put those two together and you've got the entire gospel. You believe the finished work of Christ and that is your salvation. That is our justification. It's that simple. But people make it difficult because they want to put their ego into it. How does that work, you know? Oh yeah, I've got I to do something so I feel good. I've got to do something so I can impress my wife. That's why I splash that cologne on and I smell so good, you know. So drive you over in the car, you she could get a whiff of that, you know what I mean? The point is, our ego gets in the way all the time, does it not? God doesn't care about our ego. He did everything for us. And when we understand that, our motivation shifts from dancing for God to get the good favors and the good things to giving back to the world what God has already given us. It shifts your priorities, it shifts your focus, it shifts the way you think, it shifts the peace and the joy you have with your Creator. It's as simple as that. Let's continue now and learn how this all came about. To be saved in the kingdom, so on page, I guess it's four, whatever it is. To be saved in the kingdom, you repented, changed from your old way, you, you, excuse me, changed from your old ways, and received water baptism. These believers were following Jesus. This is why they needed to feed 5,000 of them at the water's edge. He was setting that up. The message of the kingdom was to the Jews and not the Gentile world. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into the city of Samaritan, Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and go preaching, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the message. Not, we are not extended Jews. We are not the extended you know, religion of Jude Judaism today. No, we are the body of Christ. And it's totally different. Matthew chapter 15, 22 through 28. 
And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, to Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. What would Jesus do today? He wouldn't even talk to you. Okay, because that's where it was. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was his focus. So if you're focusing on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to understand your Christian walk, you are a Jew. That's what you're understanding. You're not understanding your relationship to God today. You're understanding what the Jewish people were dealing with. It is only through Jesus, it is only through Jews first that salvation was available to the world. The offer of the kingdom was to the Jews, Jewish nation, or, excuse me, Jewish nation only. I'm going to get this right. Somebody told me to slow down, and I'm trying to, okay? And not us today. And I, I appreciate the advice over there. She knows who she is in the corner behind past her. Okay. The rejection of the kingdom offer. It is Israel's rejection of the kingdom offer that was made to them that opens up the age and the dispensation of grace we now live in. Let's see how this unfolds. You need to understand this, because this is where your friends and neighbors and family members have no idea. You're talking new territory now. You're talking about waking them up to something radically different. Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning had come, all the chief priests and elders and the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Okay? Matthew chapter 27, 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Bar Barabbas and destroy Jesus. This is how it all begins to unfold here. Matthew chapter 27. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did ca cast lots. Interesting. This is how and why it all comes together. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. This is a crucial thing that happens here because it gives them another chance. What does Jesus say? Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. At that point, Israel gets another shot. Okay? They get another opportunity because Jesus asked for their forgiveness. Look closely at who addresses these in these verses. Not the whole world, as many of the churches would tell you today, but to the Jews, they're still being offered an opportunity to repent and be accepted by Christ. Acts chapter 2.14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Jerut Judah, and all them that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken my words. Who is, Paul, who is Peter talking to? Israel. Okay? Men of Judea. He's not talking to the church today. The church today comes because of Paul. And we'll get to that as we go through all this. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, not ye men of Milton, ye men of Pensacola, <laughs> ye men of the USA. All right? We were left out of the whole picture here, folks. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. All right? Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. The program continues. This is after Jesus had been killed, and this opportunity exists for Israel again. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, and the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ who before was preached unto you. Do you see any Gentiles in this yet? No. None of it existed. The modern church does not see this. What you are understanding right now is radical compared to them, and it is the truth and it's how it all fits together, and how the Bible and why the Bible was even printed and made. The Bible was created so we could understand this. It wasn't created so it could be a mystery. Paul teaches all this stuff. The whole purpose of the Bible is for us to understand it. The whole purpose of the book of Acts is to see how this all rolled out. It's called Acts. It's, it's not called gospel. It's called Acts. What happened? How things unfolded. And guess what? At the end of Acts, what happens? It quits. Where? As soon as Paul says, the Jews wouldn't get it, but the, it, but the Gentiles will, and they will believe it. And there's like three more verses after that, and the book ends. Because it is completed, the story. You follow me? The story from how it became a Jewish situation for God to a Gentile world, everybody included. 
The book of Acts teaches us that. It's just not a great story about a bunch of um, missionaries, which is what they teach, okay? That's the reality, and that's what we need to understand, okay? Where am I at here? Okay, good. The message of the kingdom was still being offered to Israel after the cru crucifixion in the first part of the book of Acts. This offering continued until the leaders of Israel stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7, and things began to change. If you ask anybody who doesn't understand dispensational theology, what's the, reason, what's, what's the benefit of stoning Stephen? What's stone, stoning of Stephen is all about? Why is it important? They would say, well, they were just being mean to him and showing that they didn't want to deal with, you know, yeah, confused. The stoning of Stephen was radically important because it's at the stoning of Stephen that things begin to change. The new chapter opens up. And let's take a look at some of those verses and understand that. All right, you guys staying with me on these papers? Okay, am I talking slow enough, fast enough? Irma's giving me the hand like this. I mean, slow, <laughs> slow it down. So, so, I got to slow it down a little bit. All right, got it. All right, there you go, that's it. Acts chapter 7, St Stephen tries to explain Christ to Israel, and they get angry about it. Hmm, where have we seen the Israelis getting angry about anything that has to do with God? How about the killing of Christ? How about other things in history? They always turn their back on God, even though he laid it out for them, even though he explained it to them. They were like, no. Why is that? What is the one thing that drove everybody? Pride, Pride ego, exactly. I got this figured out. I don't need your help. Okay? That's unfortunately man's ego, his core, I am powerful, I am important, I'm going to do it my way, has killed his opportunity with God many, many times over the years. Yeah? I got this under control. I don't need your help. And guys are worse at this than women, okay? Irma will say all the time, have you, have you prayed about this? And I'm like, no, I haven't. If I'm going to be honest, I haven't, because I don't think about it when I need to, okay? Now, during the Alabama football game, I threw a few prayers out there yesterday. I was, I was arm-twisting God to win that one, boy. It was right down on the wire. But the reality is we can't arm-twist God, but we should make our, our, our wants known, okay? That's what prayer is about. It, when I pray about something, I then give it to God, and I get less stress. It's all done. Somebody else is handling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bob, Bob's been down that road. Guy, guys, we've we got to fix everything. When our wife has a problem, we're like, well, let me tell you about this, honey. She doesn't want us to fix the problem. She just wants us to listen to her, talk about it, so she can get it off her chest. Amen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, God, being recorded. That's right. <laughs> that doesn't mean, that, that doesn't mean I, I live that way, but I understand it. Yeah, I know. I understand the concept. Okay. So that's the beginning, anyway. But let's take a look at Acts chapter 7 and see what happens here. Because it's really important what happens here. Okay, Acts chapter 7, verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, um, unto you of your brethren, and unlike me, um, him shall ye hear. Okay? He's setting them up here. Then in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, through Acts chapter 8, verse 1, here's where the story unfolds. Here's what happens to Stephen. And here's what makes a difference. Here's where things start. He's talking to them, and he goes, Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised of heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, and so do ye. So he points his finger at them, okay? And he goes, You guys are the same. You've been doing this forever. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and the murderers of, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels, and have not kept it. Ooh, those are fighting words, okay? All those Ten Commandments, all those other commandments, you haven't kept those things at all. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. I don't know what that means, but it sounds pretty painful. I don't think I want to go there. But the reality is, he pointed out their hypocrisy. And when he did that, they didn't like it. They were like, no way, let's, th this is unacceptable. 55, it's important here. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, some say he was standing to accept stoning Stephen. I think he was standing because if, if the Israel had finally got the message here, he would have set up that kingdom. He would have come back down. That's what I think. But there are a couple of thoughts on that. Either way, he's full of the Holy Spirit. He looks up and behold, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open 
and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stomped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. The mob went crazy. Stephen's in for it now. Okay? And cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Hmm, where have we seen that before? And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's a term they always use, fall asleep. They killed him. Okay? The radical group stormed him and killed him because he was pointing out their hypocrisy. And, what, and once again, they were full of it. And they did not want to deal with that. Okay? It is at this point in history, in the book of Acts, which is the history book, explaining how things happen, it is this point in history where things begin to change. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. So they were getting heat from above. And Paul was in charge of that. Paul was the one who they, they laid their stuff at his feet because he was in charge of the stoning of Stephen. He caused Stephen's death. Simple as that, okay? Was there a reason for it? Absolutely. We're going to learn that. Oh. But he caused it, and he was the one in charge. Now, Israel begins to be set aside as a nation, I have written down here. If we look back on their actions, we see with the killing of John the Baptist, uh, they looked the other way. Then they cried for you know, Barabbas and asked for, the, uh, and asked for him to get, and asked them to kill Christ. Finally, the leaders of the Jewish nation carried out their killing of Stephen, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, with their own hands, showing once again their unbelief, leading to the unveiling of the age of grace. This is something most people have never heard, never understood, and when you explain this to them, they're going to go, wow, I never heard that. And you need to be gracious at this point and say, it's exciting. Let's go on. Let's learn about it. Not, you fool, why aren't you learning this book? Because they never heard it. This is radical stuff to them. When you share this information off this piece of paper, you're going to open people's eyes. And be prepared for them to go, I've never seen this before. And you need to say, neither did I until somebody showed it to me. Neither did I until I began to understand it and study it. We can open their eyes. They have to step in and study. Okay? As things move on. Yeah, religion, right. Whatever the pastors talk about. You know, I don't know. I don't know what. The, I've never heard a message on the stoning of Stephen, so I don't know what they say about that. They just avoid it altogether because they can't explain it. What's really going on here? Well, they killed him, okay, because he was he was pointing out that they were hypocrites, okay, whatever. But th what does that mean? They don't know. It doesn't have to do it, okay? Um, the killing of Stephen was the type of act that Jesus refers to when he talks about the unpardonable sin. Have you heard that term before? Okay, let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 12. Verse 31 through 32. You know, Jesus said this, not me, not some religious leaders. What did he say? Wherefore I say, I say among, unto you, excuse me, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Wow. What was Stephen full of? The Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, was it continues on here. And, more, and, whoever, excuse me, and whoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world or in the world to come. Israel had done it now. They just didn't kill Jesus on the cross, which was bad enough. But they killed Stephen full of the Holy Spirit. All right? And he looked up and saw Jesus standing there, either to receive him or to come back down, I believe. Jesus was ready to come back down. If at this turning point in history, they would have accepted it. If they would have said, wait a minute, this makes sense. Maybe we're wrong. Okay, let's take a look at it. Things would have been radically different. But they didn't. God knew they wouldn't. And thank God they didn't in some ways. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Okay? It is only at this point that the dispensation of grace, which is what we are in now, where we have grace with God through the faith of our belief in Christ, began to open up. It unraveled over a little bit of time, but it began to unravel. And that's where we're at today. We don't mix all these together and try to take the Jews from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and turn them into the, 
the body of Christ. They're two different things. And when you see that, then you begin to understand where your life is today. Then you begin to understand how it all fits together. Paul, our apostle, which was called Saul, he changed his name to Paul, all right? He's called out to deliver this new message. Paul gets the call. And boy, I bet he was probably surprised at that. <laughs> or the, the TV show is Call Saul or something like that on TV or something like that. Yeah, well, in this case, Paul, okay? And thank God he was given this information so that what? We could understand it. He talks about the dispensation of grace as a mystery. This was a mystery that was hidden from the whole world. The Jews were to set up a kingdom. They rejected Christ again and again and again. They, they rejected Christ and killed him. Now this opening of the dispensation of grace that we live in now, this great mystery was beginning to unravel. What a beautiful thing. What an amazing thing when you begin to understand it and you put it together. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Hmm, Paul had a big job. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given me to you were. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, Paul gets the message. Paul delivers the message to the world. All these people and these other religious, Christian religions, say, I believe in Jesus Christ on the cross. Well, guess what? That's Paul's message. They just don't get the full message. Prior to Paul talking about Jesus on the cross and the value of that, they had no idea what it meant. Okay? He brings that to them, but they don't study it enough to understand it's not about performance. It's about letting the finished work of Christ do it. God reconciled the world. Whether you choose to participate in that or not is your choice. But the reconciliation was made when the cross happened. Think about that for a minute. This isn't about you performing to get there. It's about you accepting what was already done. And that is taking your ego out of the picture. Okay? That's very hard for people to do. It's hard for anybody to do. It's hard for me to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I can handle this. Whatever. You know, that's our nature. The reality is God finished it. We just accept it. It's really that simple. Okay? Um, verse 3. How that by revelation, hmm, revelation, what does that word mean? It was revealed to Paul. It was given to Paul. It was not something you could study in the Old Testament and understand. It was a gift that was given to him. He made, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in many words, whereby when you read, you may understand the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which, chapter, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the Son of Man, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This was a radical, radical new way to look at your relationship to God. It was no longer about Jewishness. It was no longer about the, the things that the Jews did. It was no longer about the temple. It was about our acceptance of the finished work in the dispensation of grace and the mystery, the mystery that we had, okay? Now, at this point, if you're teaching this to somebody, they're probably overwhelmed. <laughs> this is a good time to get up, get a cup of coffee, sit down again, and let them relax a minute. Because all this stuff is going to be new to them. We hear it all the time in our studies, but it's going to be new to them. And it's going to be radical. They're going to see part of it, they're going to understand part of it, and they're not going to understand part of it. But you're going to have to just share it with them. It's so important to do that, okay? Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Wherefore I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. That's the message Paul got. That's the message we have today. If you're going to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John trying to figure out how to live as a Christian today, you're in trouble. Because that's not where we live. That was for the Jews. And that changed in the middle of the book of Acts. And by the end of Acts, it opened up to the whole world. Our salvation is in understanding what Christ did on the cross and accepting that as our punishment, you know, punishment for sin. Okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. <coughs> that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him. All things in Christ means the Jews and the Gentiles. It means the entire world. It means the Muslims. 
who are over there doing the Muhammad thing. All those things he brings together, an opportunity is there for anyone today to accept Christ. When I say accept, that means understand it, understand what it meant, understand what he did, and that is your salvation. Anyone and everyone is available to that. That's where the whole world comes in. And for 2,000 years, that's where it's been, roughly 2,000 years. That's where it's been. What a beautiful place to be. We are living in the best times in the world. If we lived 3,000 years ago, we'd be without God. We would not have a chance. Okay? And that's a sad thing, but that's the reality of it. Okay? This is a program. God put it together. The message of grace includes Israel falling through unbelief, which we've studied, making both Jew and Gentiles the same. Salvation is by faith apart from works. Apart from works. That's really hard for some people to digest. Who was it? Just, we were just talking about somebody, sanctification. And this is a grace church. We got to talking about that again this morning in the car. I don't know how these things happen. But anyway, you know, we were talking, we're doing good time work. It's great. Yeah, this, this gentleman teaches in his Sunday school class, salvation is the easy part. Being sanctified is difficult. Yeah, th that salvation is the easy part, but being sanctified or purified in God's eyes is the difficult part. That's why I don't get called back anymore, yeah. Uh, well, I, I challenged him very nicely. I didn't, like, beat on him. I just said, no, wait a minute. What about this? What about? The reality is this, folks. When you accept the finished work of Christ and you go, oh, this is my salvation, what God did for me, you stand perfected in God's eyes 100% of the time. Every single time. And when I'm at the beach and some girl goes by in a swimsuit that sh shouldn't be looked at, and I look at it because I do, because I'm a guy, God doesn't even see that. Okay? Don't look twice. <laughs> that, that, that was somebody, that was, uh, that was somebody, yeah, that was somebody's adv advice to me. So I, I've taken that to heart, I think. Anyway, the reality is this, folks. We still have our, second, our old nature. The reality is we also have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. We have both those things going on in our lives. Opportunity. Wow, oh, last week, the black couple, gentlemen, there's, there's a couple at this place. We went to eat this Chinese place, and there was this couple, you know, this lady's in a walker, and she can hardly move, and her husband, what a wonderful guy. He got her all these plates of food for the Chinese thing. Yeah, it was very really tender. It really was. And so um, we bought their lunch. They have no idea who did it. We left. Who knows? But... But, but those opportunities, I always say those things because there's lots of them that come up. You see something like that, say, wow, what a loving couple. He's in his suit, he's all decked out, she's barely, yeah, 90s, whatever, you know, they're older than me anyway, and um, she's in a little walker, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that hurts, that, that, really, that really hurts. <laughs> that goes right to my sore ribs from last week when I fell off my bike. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. The reality is opportunities. And it may not be buying somebody lunch. It may be just helping somebody out with something. It may be sharing the gospel with somebody. It may be all sorts of opportunities to share the love of Christ. And when you do that, now you're changing the world. Now you're changing the world because of what God has done for you instead of what can I do to win favor with God, to make God happy, okay? I mean, I was praying for Alabama, buddy, a couple times. I mean, I'm sure a very selfish prayer. It's like, come on, give us at least one more touchdown here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, our problem is we didn't bring Trish in early enough as the coach. You know? Anyway, the reality is, folks, the love of Christ constrains us, gives us the opportunity to do things, puts us in the opportunity to go out there and make a difference in the world. That's what we're all about now. We're not about performing to win favor with God. We're about doing things because of what God has done for you. Change the thinking. Change your attitude. Change the look at it, okay? It's totally different. Um, <coughs> where am I at here? I'm totally lost. I have no idea. Okay. The new message is, is majorly different. Paul even has to explain it to the apostles. <coughs> because they didn't see it, he did. Then 14 years later, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I'll slow down here. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. They were like, what are you doing here? Okay. I see it. Okay. She said, I have a half hour, so we're good. Um, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means they should run, heard run in vain. It's the same with you. You don't need to point out grace to somebody and go, na, 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 look at me, I get this and you don't. No. You need to point it out with the love of Christ. 
Let me share with you something that can change your perspective on God. You want to be more connected to God? I got some understanding here I can share with you. Okay? He had to do the same thing there, okay? Um, but neither Titus, uh, who was with me being Greek, was compelled to be circumstanced. He's pointing out the fact that they just didn't try to do the Jewish thing. They weren't compelled to do it because it was a different program. Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was to Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter, uh, the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mightily toward me and the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, and Peter talks about that in his books. He goes, it's hard to understand what Paul's talking about here. You know, he, he brings that up in, in, in Peter, Second Peter, whatever it is. Three, yeah. yeah, it's hard to understand that. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go into the heathen and they into the circumcision. The heathen. We are that. We are the heathen. Okay, and thank God they did. Thank God the dispensation of grace was opened up for Dave. And thank God I ran into somebody who understood that early in my life. By 15, I was under the study of a, a, a minister who understood the dispensation of grace and preached from it. And boy, it changed everything. I have never felt angst with God. Isn't that interesting? I've never felt, oh, what am I doing? I'm making this right now. I felt, mm, I shouldn't be doing this. Okay, let's change the way I'm going here. All right? But I still am at peace with my Creator. Okay? Always have been. And I've been very blessed to be there. Very, very blessed. I think about it. Remember when I talk about it once in a while, it's just like, yeah, doesn't everybody understand this? You know, that's all I knew from 15 or so on. Very lucky. Very lucky. Our goal today. Here we go. This is what we are all about. This is why we understand this dispensation of grace. This is why we understand this mystery. So that we can share it with others. That's why it's on these papers. We kill trees. And we'll kill more trees. And if you need a copy of this, I'll put my, my email on the board. If you're out there in TV land and you'd like a copy of it. The reason I put all the verses in here, so it's nine pages, is because I don't want you to have to spend time flipping through your book to find these things. I want you to be able to share it with people and say, take a look at this. This is pretty interesting. It's amazing. What does God say in, in 1 Timothy 2, 4? Who would have all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants. Being saved is first. And you can be saved knowing very little bit about the dispensation of grace. If you understand the finished work of Christ and believe that he came and died on the cross for your justification and you accept that, you're saved. Whether you know more or not, your salvation is still there. The more you study, the more you can come into the knowledge of the truth. It's really that simple. But it starts out with salvation. If you're not saved, and I believe everybody in this room probably is, but if you're not saved, you need to commit to that first. You need to understand your relationship to God and your relationship to Christ and what he did for you. When you understand that, what he did is my salvation and it's my justification, and I therefore accept it, not just know about it, but accept that for my salvation. I say, my eternity is with God. What a great place to be. Think about it. You know, I'm 65, and, and, and I'm hopefully going to live maybe another six months. But anyway, the point is, I've got eternity with Christ, with God. I'm set. If I fall off my roof tomorrow and snap my neck, I'm in a better place. I'm not getting on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. She would be standing over me yelling at me while I'm dead. That's what, that's, that's what would happen. You know? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. This is what we do now. This is what our opportunity is. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. Of the mystery. Look what it says. Well, it doesn't say the fellowship of Judaism. It doesn't say the fellowship of what Christ did while walking on the earth, feeding the 5,000 down by the river. No, it says the mystery. Understand that mystery that was hidden that Paul unveils. And that's what we have today. Men could not teach us this revolutionary understanding of God's grace, but it was hidden God and only revealed after Christ's death and resurrection. Why do you think it was not revealed earlier? They would never kill Christ. Yeah. I mean, Satan would have avoided killing Christ. I believe he was very principled in killing Christ. And if he knew what it meant, truly, he would not have done it. He would not want to open up to the world salvation to everybody because of this act. No, no, let, let, him, let him run the Jewish nation for a while and let's see what happens. 
I mean, he would not have done that, okay? The reason it was hid was not was so that Satan could not understand the significance of Christ's death and resurrection. If he had understood that, all that he meant, he, flipped the page, would never have crucified Christ. Remember that Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. At that point, he gave up the spirit and died. Last thing he said, it is finished. What he had done was going to save the world, and it was finished. That's great. Let's take a look here. Paul was taught by direct revelation, a greater understanding of the death of Christ. Paul was taught, read that again, by direct revelation, a greater understanding of the death of Christ. Salvation by faith apart from works, and how all could come to God through faith. That's what he was shown. Not that we had to become Jews, not that we had to go to the altar, not that we had to do sacrifices, not that we had to do tithing, not that we had to do all these things that, you know, walk the aisle for Jesus, you know, get baptized, whatever, all these things that Christianity throws in the picture. This has nothing to do with your salvation. Let's look at 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern for them. Uh, simple as that. Paul is an example. He killed S Stephen. He was there organizing the stoning of Stephen in the middle of Acts, remember? He was the guy in charge. He killed them, killed them off. Yet God goes to him and says, I'm going to set you up as an example. What better example than to take your number one enemy and save him first? By grace. By grace. There's nothing Paul did to deserve salvation. Quite the opposite, okay? But God said, no, this is what salvation is, and here's why it exists, because of the finished work of Christ, and I want you to go to the world and teach that. And Paul said, oh, okay. And he suffered for it. A lot. A lot. You know, all of us who share Christ, for what do we get persecution today? Somebody goes, well, that's good for you, but then they walk away. Come on, that's about it, okay? Nobody has slapped me or screamed at me or anything. I've had a couple of radical folks try to change me. But, you know, that's pretty minimal. You know, I don't change easily, so it's not an issue. But the point is this. We are now Paul. We are now the people who share the love of Christ. We are now the people who explain this to people so they can join us, so they can be part of that, because being part of that is eternity. It's not for the next three months or six months or four years or six years. It's forever. Ever is a long time. I don't understand ever. Okay? I do know that the first 65 years of my life went by like that. Okay? <laughs> so now ever is going to go by fast too, but I'm going to be in the right place. Yeah. Take forever? I think uh, <laughs> time has gone to zero. It may, you may be very right. It won't matter anymore. It won't be relative. Yep. We only measure time by the fact that we roll. Yep. And we do. That's true. Okay. First, First Corinthians 3, 10 through 11. According to the grace of God, which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. That's what we're doing. He laid the foundation. We're building it. We're throwing up the sticks and the stones and whatever, you know, and, and putting some walls up. And the whole point is we're trying to change the world. And you're going to change Christianity by helping them see this. <coughs> Understand how the dispensation of grace began, why it began, and how it unra unveiled. The more they know about that, the stronger they're going to be, and the more they're going to, one, first, first of all, be saved by faith only. That's the most important thing. And then secondly, the more knowledge they have, the more at peace they can be. Being at peace with your Creator is a wonderful place to be. It doesn't get any better, you know? You go to bed at night, and despite what all the craziness in the world is, you're at peace. You know, you go to bed at night despite employees that are crazy and this and that, or things you deal with or clients that are nuts, you're at peace. Hey, it's part of the game, you know? Remember and I were talking about that. We don't get stressed about much. We have to take care of things. We'll make sure this happens. You know, i got things to do. i got a list of to-do things. i got to get them all done. But stress? Eh, I'm going to survive. I can lose a few pounds. I can go without eating for a while. Not a problem. You know? But it's true. You know? That's just it. Um, and then, you know, for, for other foundation can no man lay than that was laid, which is Christ Jesus. Amen. He's it. He's the bottom, okay? We rightly divide our Bibles. We see that all of, all of this is for our understanding and benefit. However, not all of it is for our daily living. We understand how God has dealt with man through the ages 
and where we are today. We will, we will better live uh, for and repent God in this, uh, to, excuse me, represent God in this world. By understanding the dispensational theology, we eliminate confusion and find salvation. Very important. Salvation is not out there unless you understand Paul. True salvation is not available to people unless they understand Paul. Works, activities, Christianity is available anywhere. Millions of people. In these counties alone, there's probably 40,000, 50,000 people that have gone to church this morning, and they're busy doing their works. And I'm doing this and this and this. and they're, Oh, and they're wearing some really good clothes, too, by the way. You know, they are dialed up. I actually, I actually put, Irma asked me to wear the blue shirt. I was going to wear a T-shirt, but she said, no, no, wear the blue shirt. That makes you look young. I said, okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work. This is, this is really, this is a tough audience. Tough audience. At any rate, that's what we're all about, folks. This information has been developed, and all these trees were killed so you can give this to other people and share it with them. Walk them through it. Don't just hand it to them. Say, look, let's go together and let's talk about it. Walk them through it and let them see that because it's going to change lives. You're going to be that seed that can bring somebody to salvation, okay, who's not there now, who thinks they might be. They know of Jesus, and so does the so does Satan know who Jesus is, but they don't have salvation. And you can be that character, the person who makes the difference. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to teach, the opportunity to be in a group that understands and cares and loves Christ, and that focuses on sharing this mystery, on making a difference in the world in any way we can, and help us this week to reach out to other people, touch somebody with the love of Christ, and if opportunities arise, help explain something to them. Help them explain why you're at peace with your Creator. Help them explain where salvation comes from so they too can understand that and have eternity in a beautiful place as well. In your name, amen. Let's take a break.